Hello, welcome to Fuse from PRCA, the podcast for professionals in marketing, communications, and public relations. My name's Dan Gold, and on this episode, we've got Martin Raymond, and I'm very excited. Farzana Badwell, who is our brand new co-host, is with us as well. And we might as well start as we mean to go on. Farzana, thank you so much for joining me on our first joint episode. Thank you so much, Dan. I've been stalking you on Instagram for years. Uh, Finally, finally uh, got through. Really thrilled to start this podcast journey with you. So thank you for having me. It's truly my pleasure and a bit of a a mutual appreciation society of as someone who I've followed since my days working in London. I truly admire the work that you do. But today um, we are in a, a space where we live in the now and we do look to the future. But maybe you could take us on to that next step of, of introducing Martin and what does that future hold? So Martin Raymond is one of the world's leading futurists with a track record of discovering the next big thing. Martin co-founded the Future Laboratory and works with brands such as Google, Spotify and Selfridges. The Future Lab are leaders in trend forecasting, consumer insight, foresight, brand strategy and innovation to inspire and future-proof organisations. So Martin, first of all, thank you so much for sharing your insight and hopefully gazing into the crystal ball uh, for us uh, mere mortals. So you started Future Lab in year 2000 with two people and a dog. Indeed. Did you you predict your own success? I think we had a sense at the time. So if you actually think about it, although our business was set up in 2000, we really started trading in 2001. And in fact, we started trading on September 12th, 2001. So if anybody remembers that particular date, September the 11th was one of the great shifts and changes globally in terms of how potentially we would be looking at the future. And I remember chatting to a journalist on Newsweek on the 9th of September, and saying to her, look, we're doing this project, which is, a, you know, it's part of our new company, which is really about forecasting and looking at tomorrow. And it was a piece about then the changing guard from what was Gen X to millennials, so the incoming cohort that we looked at as millennials. And, and you know, it was a fairly civil conversation. And uh, the next day I'd sent a fax. I'm not sure if people remember faxes. Yeah. But we were in our business. It was in a bedroom. There was a fax machine. There was a dog looking expectantly at the fax machine thinking it was going to feed out food and uh, on the day the the um twin towers were attacked i was simply trying to get a fax through and i noticed that nothing was happening so i phoned up newsweek uh fo- spoke to friends uh, in other places said, look you haven't seen what has happened have you so i said no no, no. i've switched on this cracky old television and i saw the first tower being breached And what it reminded me of then, because people said, what a terrible time to set up a business, you know, when there's about to be a fairly major global disaster. And I said, well, actually, that's the best time to set up any business is a time when you're testing things under stress, under crisis, under challenge and under unknowns. And I think that really reminded me that... um, you know, as a business, and certainly when we were looking at the business moving forward from 2001, what we were trying to do was to take uncertainty, to see that as the beginning of the journey, and then to map forward using uncertainty as a context for developing future scenarios and strategies. And the reason I say that is a lot of people think about foresight. They say, well, actually, it's fairly easy because you're looking at at, at um, known markets, predictable moments, uh, fairly clear data streams, and uh, cycles that seem to happen in five-year kind of positionings or five-year changes. And what I was trying to remind people is that if you think about uncertainty and you think about black swan moments, you know, those things that we are just not predicting because we don't believe they will happen, that if that's the principle for foresight, then it gives you a much different view on the market. So really, I 
job is to look at uncertainty, to map it, but to use those constant shifts in the culture and the climate to help clients better sail forth, better manage and better navigate seas that are constantly choppy and different and challenging and, to use that word again, uncertain. So so you felt that your company was, in essence, born in an era of huge uncertainty uh, and trauma for the world. Um, and uh, and that's where, you know, I'd love to ask you a bit about the history of forecasting, uh, because, of course, we all know about Notre Dame. Um, but if you take us all the way back, who, you know, who were your sort of predecessors? Yeah, I think it's, it's um, I, I guess with a lot of people, we confuse forecasting with prediction. So that's one. So Nostradamus to me would be traditional, you know, he's dealing in predictions, uh, you know, as were the Sybils, as were the Delphi Oracle. So really that was about looking at how potentially you could suit say tomorrow. So you're using, you know, intuition, you're using uh, mystical, psychical, um, strange powers that are not provable or visible or tangible to actually uh, carve a pathway or to predict a pathway into tomorrow. Um, what I tend to look at is think about military strategy. So if you go back into history, you had, for example, uh, Sima Kwan, who was a Chinese uh, historian, who used the past and current shifts in political changes in economic circumstances, in population drifts, as you refer to them, to potentially create a map of tomorrow. So if you think already we're getting a sense of triangulation, uh, Ibam Khalidin, who was a, a, a very famous Arab sociologist in the Middle Ages, looked again at how you would use needs of people, desires of people, and what he called hankerings for the next to begin to understand how you could map out what tomorrow could look like, both in terms of you know people, in terms of governments, in terms of cities, uh, in terms of potential for how people would either choose war or choose p peace. So again, you've got this kind of political, militaristic, but increasingly strategic viewpoint about potentially how we could uh, think about tomorrow. Um, books, for example, if you've read, and I think probably everybody has heard about Utopia, you know, Thomas More's Utopia. So what you're beginning to see is as you move through history, uh, more books that are beginning to look at how we manage our view of tomorrow, but also the mechanisms for how we look at the process. So we're using economic, we're using science, we're using politics. But by the time you get to the 18th to 19th century, they're using technology to look at. And they're beginning to use, I guess, what I call true cartography and mapping. So if you think about H.G. Wells, you know, the great science fiction writer, quite a lot of his books use a process which is really about speculative fiction. So what if? So the science is here, the technology is here, the innovation is here, the sociology is here. We also have a sense of how the ethical and the moral is applied to it. So put all of those together, crush them together, and that's how forecasting reaches the 20th century. My God, what a fascinating world of forecasting. And of course, Martin, you know, your background um, started off in, in journalism and uh, and magazines and, and so forth. And of course, you published the Trend Forecasters Handbook. And I've got a copy over here. And oh it's, my God. it's a heavy duty read, but it is gripping. And I've actually, and I've been reading it and realizing how much of it actually applies to the world of public relations, which we'll be speaking about um, later. Um, I wanted to ask you now, this book that you've created, and you've obviously um, authored a number of them, the, it's required reading for university courses, colleges, and so forth. Um, why did you feel the need to add academic rigor to a field that historically was considered, you know, sort of a expert by those who are innately intuitive um, or observant, and of course, sort of, you know, use the term sort of 
prediction tr and trends yeah. uh, with forecasting and not quite knowing the difference. I mean, did you sort of feel as if you were sick and tired of explaining what you do uh, and to people at drinks parties and then you could at least just say, well, here's my book, order it from Amazon and, you know, educate yourself. <laughs> exactly that, because, you know, having, I guess, worked in journalism and, you know, understanding that a lot of the time you're writing stories where you research background, you call in expert opinion, you speak to analysts, you look at data, you, you um, in some ways, you, you, you also create scenarios, you build scenarios because you're trying to build a story and, and a positioning within that story that other people will either understand or be challenged by. And a lot of the time, that's how forecasting works. And when I would explain it to people, they always saw it in terms of prediction, intuition. Um, but even those two things, which have hugely laudable and relevant positionings, were seen to be dismissive. And as somebody said, when you have a sentence, you have an adjective and a facts in it, fact rather. And these things were seen as the adjectives of the sentence rather than the fact. So I thought, well, let me research it. And when I was researching it, I realized that, you know, its history goes back to, as we were saying earlier, you know, kind of 145 BC. But more recently, in the 20th century, quite a lot of schools had come through, like on academic side, teaching future studies, um, right. on military side, teaching strategy and anticipation, um, French governmental studies, you know, teaching what they call perspectives analysis, which is where they developed in government, hugely important departments and teams that were designed to look at what if we don't make X target or what if a population explodes or what if we have, you know, higher levels of immigration than we were expecting. So, you know, across different societies and cultures, you've always had this sense of how potentially we should be looking at tomorrow and then the frameworks from which we do that. And I think the, the um, you know, if you look at the book, it really gives you uh, basic mechanisms. It gives you historic mechanisms. It gives you military processes and 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 um strategic strategies and procedures but also i was really trying to distinguish between you know foresight which is um historic data current analysis and forward projection uh, scenario planning which is really about taking those two or three things and then using intuition using experts point of view using disruption and anomalous opportunities to create many possible futures because as we know tomorrow hasn't happened so we're looking at, at you know five six ten scenarios to tell you what could be done so really the book i think was a proof that i wasn't um making things up at a party uh b that i should be taken seriously which i've you know as, as, as um an irishman abroad is always a challenge anyway and uh see that um when I meet friends who are economists, I realize that they are more precarious and more open to challenge and more open to, I think, being dismissed. Because if I, you know, if I put my forecast next to economic forecasts, I can tell you over time, mine are better. And I know why they're better. It's because I involve more people in my forecast, where an economist uses a model, I'm looking at people. And as we know, that behavioral economics has really taken over because it supposes correctly that people matter in any kind of forecast, where economics assumes people as a utility, not as a personality. And therefore, it's as you know, there are no wealthy economists that I know, certainly, because if they were always right, they would be betting on the markets and getting it super right. So I, I kind of feel that that was when I'd written the book, I wanted it there as proof. But I also, to your point that, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a university publication, it's a head of foresight publication, it's now used by, uh, you know, training teams across different departments to really give them a framework of how the thing could work to give them a sense that um, it's a trustable framework and it's a tested framework. And also there's, there's a science behind it. There's an art behind it. We can't forget those two things. And thirdly, um, there's there's an intuition behind it. And, you know, we, we to your point earlier, we tend to see intuition and prediction as something we should dismiss. But intuition in itself has a huge 
science that sits behind it. And that was the third bit I folded into the book to remind people that when they say, oh, well, it's just, you know, it's just a hunch, um, hunches in themselves are hugely important in how we build strategic and accurate and, dare I say it, agile forecasts. Could we just look at um, the anatomy of a trend? Because, you know, there's some areas where something might be a fad or a really micro macro moment and other things are truly trends over an extended period. What makes a trend a trend? And in, in that sense, when you look at generations, for example, Gen, Gen Z, uh, how, do you, how do you assess what the, those steps will be with your meth- methodology? I th- let's look at, you know, first of all, what a trend is at its most basic. Like it's, it's um, activity along a vector. You know, the, 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 it's a t- like the French would use the word tendance, which means like uh, it's an arrow or it's a movement or it's, a, you know, a forward momentum. So that's a kind of a basic understanding. It is also tied into an anomaly. So trends are not patterns that happen in, in a, you know, a large scale. They begin as a minor disruption or an anomaly. So if you think about what's known as the, the, the um, curve of innovation, it starts off with innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority. So you're mapping along those lines of forward momentum, changes that will have either initial minor disruptions, and then it works out to be a major. So what you look at is what are the anomalous shifts? What are the pattern breaks? What are changes that seem to run counter to current values or current views or accepted um, cultural or social or ethical more? So really, our business is focused on not the majority view, which is what a marketing um, business will do, like Data Monitor, you know, Ipsos, um, YouGov, etc. They're looking at majority views. What we're looking at is the tiny 2% of shift and change that seems to be irritating and annoying and counter and potentially rebellious because all of these things start off as a rebellion and they end up living in the suburbs. I mean, that's how I see these things. You know, it, it starts out in a blog and it ends up being Daily Mail headlines. And that's the bit that we, we're trying to map. And I think the, 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 the mistakes made about trends are we're seeing them as a volume thing because we're only hearing about them when they're visible. So think about organic food, the use of CBD oils, uh, synthetic non-processed meats, you know, the notion that we've gone now into to kind of plant-based foods and actually we're moving from plant-based to lab-grown. So these were things that we were reporting on probably 10 years ago. So we map, we have a trend tracker that maps how these things are shifting by percentage point, by visibility, by consumer buy-in, by how it sits into what we call the Overton window. The Overton window was developed to work out what plausibly sits within the public's ability to debate it and what sits outside it. Journalists are only interested in what sits inside it because you read what you want to know about. We look at what sits outside the Overton window. So CBD, psychedelic medicine, the notion of lab grown meat, all of these things, the fact that we can produce and somebody said, great, at last, as a woman or a man, we don't have to be involved in childbirth. So we're now producing an embryo that does not require any human contact and does not require you to force your child to go to public schools or watch stupid TV. So suddenly, that's how we grow our business. And a lot of people go initially, and this is how I think trends work. Initially, it's dismissed. Secondly, it's seen as a other, not part of us. It's absurd. And the third is you're wearing it. So I always look at which at which point that trend has been seen. And, you know, what? why do I read the Daily Mail? People ask me, why do I read the Daily Mail? Because, you know, it's just it's nothing to do with me. I read it to know that something is dead or is dying or is about to pass from the world. And that tells me that when a brand or a trend or something that's happened in the culture hit that point of what we call laggard maturity, then it's of no longer of interest to us. So a lot of my my advice to CEOs is, again, also look at context. 
you know, look at where these things are sitting and how they're being reported. And when they're being reported in this way, as a business, if you're not out of that market and you're not in it to do cheaper versions and you're not in it to milk people for, for, for kind of more stringent, um, damaging possibilities, then you shouldn't be there. So it's, it's, it's kind of anomalous initially, growth uh, visible, then it becomes opportunity. So if you're a brand, you're investing in early majority to late majority, that's where profit sits. If you are a forward thinking organization, I, I, I add um, PR and reputational management companies in this, you're looking to the innovator and the early adopter, because what you're trying to do is to equip yourself, arm yourself with the best possible tools that allows you to speak to your teams and your clients so you are forewarning them. Just in terms of um, different roles within an organization, different departments tend to take leads on different things and where the responsibility lies. But specifically bringing this to uh, public relations communications marketers, how can they benefit truly from harnessing those forecasting tools and gather those signals to predict trends? And, and for example, what are the tools? Yeah, I, I, I'm look. I think trends are out there; they're free. Really, the issue what you have to do is how you contextualize them and what it is you're trying to answer. So I always go, "What's the question?" So with all of our clients, I go, uh, "You know, is 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 the question? You know, is it about a product, a service? It's about a political stance? Is it about um, consumer sentiment?" So once I determine the question, I then have a fairly clear line of attack to answer that. You know, one stakeholder interviews are we all saying the same thing are we all asking the same questions are we all feeling that we're chasing the same goal two what do we know you know the the the, the kind of known knowns and the known unknowns because it's important to know what people know before you set out on the journey because what you tend to find is that people only know their specialisms and they take an organizational view of what the potential challenges and crises are but when i look outside that i go well this is not what the consumer is thinking. It's not what your competitor is thinking, but also more crucially, there are disruptors lurking in the bushes who are not from your industry and not from your specialism who are going to come and wipe you out. So think about how banking has been outfoxed by FinTech. Think about how the hospitality industry has been outfoxed by Airbnb. You know, in each sector and in each part of our life, it is not the known unknowns or the unknown knowns. It is the unknown, unknown, unknowns that come in and knock us down. So part of our job is to literally capture all of that, to present it back to the client before we set out on the journey. Then having agreed on what we now disagree on, because a lot of the times clients will not agree with me as to what their threat is. And I go, fine, I will keep my threats running parallel to yours because I will put a bet on that my threats are greater and are more likely to trip you up because you are not seeing them as a threat. Then I do a quant survey of customers, if it's a customer-based thing or it's a government-based thing or whatever, of the people who know them and of the people who don't care about them because I want to see the difference between those who believe in the thing and those who are agnostic. Because if you are trying to grow a brand or create a proposition, you don't care about your followers. They already follow you. You really should be caring about the people who have no view of you. Then I bring in my experts, not the experts you want, the experts I think have an opinion. So these are disruptors and they're innovators. They sit on the margins of culture because at this stage, I'm still looking at all of the unknown, unknown, unknowns to see what it is we are missing out on. Because at the end of the day, I'm trying to develop opportunity and positioning and potentially to help you be the disruptor, not the person following you. Then I put together what I call my thesis. So I'm now putting together a thesis of action, which is taking in the stakeholder, taking in the experts, taking in the quant, taking in the qual, taking in the disruption. And now I'm developing a framework that I sit back with the client and go back to them. How are we feeling? How close are you to this? How different are we feeling about what you're thinking? And also, how is this reflecting the bigger market change? So by this point, we are midway through our forecast. The next level is to add more data, more expert thinking, 
more what I call anomalous disruptors, people who are brought in to absolutely irritate and annoy and challenge. So, for example, I'm dealing with a company where um, they, they, they felt they were doing quite a lot for the environment. They were doing, you know, they are, they, you know, they're a caring business. They think about their employees. They think about their position, whatever. So I brought in people from, from um, you know, uh, extinction rebellion and from you know stop the city marches and they were really threatened by this I said, why are you threatened if you're doing the thing right there is no threat on the other hand if you're feeling threatened you know there is something not right so let's talk about this additional level to our forecast and then you begin to disrupt and you begin to shake out and you begin to see okay maybe we are too blinkered you know maybe we're using instrumentation that is fit for rear view purpose not for a forward view because that's a lot of people look at well we've done this before let's keep doing the same thing in the future and as we know tools from the yesterday are not great for divining what we should be doing tomorrow so at this point we're two-thirds through the whole forecasting thing we now need to capture it so what is the question how are we proposing a framework solution and how now do we develop capabilities within a business to ensure that they're able to deliver what it is that's required of them? Because a lot of the time we produce a forecast and analysis and they go, great, and that's it. And what you realize is they just don't have the tools. They don't have the belief system. They don't have the buy-in. And I think this is where if you think about um, you know, PR businesses, they are no longer about public relations. They are about the notion of how you strategically develop a point of view within a business so that the business is better insulated, one, two, better equipped, and three, better charged with owning its future. So those, that, those are the bits that you finally bring into the forecast is how do we own the space? How do we become better at conversing in it? And how do we then develop a positioning that allows us to be seen to be not just leaders, but to be seen to be innovators, you know, fair play innovators, which is what we want to be. And I think when I get through that, and that's about 15, there's about 15 points in my, my, my kind of scale of activity, I then feel it's time to sit and you know unveil the show because all of these things are done incrementally and i think this is where the you know you've got the data bit you've got the the observational bit that what i call the the the, the, the um measurement that isn't to be always identified because you you need to see it and the third bit is the intuition you know that's my expert analysis it's the in-house teams it's my view of how these things and people like me we've got a, a panel that's called our future 1000 which is 1000 thinkers who are paid essentially to be disagreeable because they, they they you know they have to sit there and disagree if you're mcdonald's i will bring in my synthetic meats people i'll bring in my animal cruelty people i'll bring in my uh you know government legislation people i'll bring in the you know the dietitian people because i really i want you to understand that what you think only matters if what you think is in sync or required by the wider consumer. And as soon as there's a fractious incursion, that means you have to be on high alert. And a lot of the time, businesses are not on high alert because they're basing the forecast of what has gone before. They're not basing the forecast of what is yet to come. And a lot of the time, as we know, the Black Swan 2001 attack in the Twin Towers, recession in 2007, they are pretty unpredictable. In fact, they're not. They're not unpredictable. They were predicted. We just didn't listen. It's like, you know, if you look at the, the, the recent committees happening in London because of, of um, you know, the COVID pandemic, one of the first testaments I heard over the past two days is that it is inevitable, not it's possible, it is inevitable that we will face another global pandemic. And yet, I will put a bet on, despite the inevitability, we will not be prepared for the next pandemic. Why? Well, because it's, think it's an anomaly. It's a one-off in a lifetime moment. Never will it happen again. And I think, unfortunately, there will be another 500,000 deaths because our lack of preparedness is seen to be standard and our lack of our, our, our desire to anticipate is seen to be anomalous. And it should be the other way around. It should be the other way around if we're going to really get the things that we're trying to do with, with clients in the world absolutely spot on. 
So Martin, uh, I just want to get a little bit granular on the methodologies, just so that the listeners can take some, you know, some sort of like a, you know, tools home with them and and sort of critical thinking. Um, so your methodology for forecasting involves the influence of five global drivers. Um, so A, I want to know what those drivers are. B, having read your book, you discuss sort of measuring the driver's impact against seven core human needs. Uh, and again, I'd love to know what they are. So if you could talk us through your five drivers and the five core human needs um, so that, you know, we can really grasp, um, you know, the, this methodology that you've invented and, um, and that forecasters are applying throughout the world. I mean, simply put, if you think about it, needs are based on human desires. So you have attainment, belonging, people will recognize these, curiosity, identity, purpose and security. So pretty much if you talk to any psychologist, they're the things that more or less they would agree on that have an impact on how we think as people. However, they are influenced and driven by what I call the kind of big global drivers. So accelerating technology, people are familiar with that, climate change and resource. So it's not just the climate, it's the impact and what that does at resource. Dislocated world, you know, how the world has become more fractures, challenging. Um, global versus local, you know, one point in the 90s, we were talking about globalization. Now you're talking about localization. So the globalization, um, changing demographics, we know hugely important. If you think about the battles between boomers, Gen Z, you know, millennials, Gen X, we've forgotten about Gen X, but they're coming back with a vengeance. And then the urban mindset. You know, we talk about how everybody, you know, is, is, is kind of rural based in thinking, but actually a lot of us live in the city and that hugely drives value. So they're the things that we look at and start mapping out all of our thinking against. And having read your book, it also talks about um, that you look at these drivers and you look at the, the human needs, but you also look at value shifts. And I've always been fascinated how, you know, value shifts, you know, they percolate across society. So, uh, you, and when you have movements like Black Lives Matter, uh, the Me Too movement, and then all of a sudden what was socially, you know, acceptable uh, 20 years ago is considered really bad. Um, and so, um, you know, so I just wanted to know about, you know, how do you, how do you approach not only sort of identifying when value shifts occur, um, but how those value shifts will, will actually shift again in the future? I think, you know, values in themselves are hugely important to forecast. So what we tend to do is to monitor using probably the same, you know, social media listening tools, interviews. Um, we've got a team of 20 people here who just look at the culture and suck it in and go, so what are the things we're seeing that are standard, you know, a view about X? And where is that standard or value changing. So while you will have um, things like diversity and inclusion as a broad bucket, when you have things like Black Lives Matter and when you have things like Me Too, that accelerates how those things come to the fore. So if you think about from the 60s onwards, we were asking questions about color and race. You know, we were asking questions about gender. You know, think about uh, equality. You know, people talk about, you know, male, female equality. Well, it's inequality, not equality. So that continued, certainly from the 19th century, but in the 60s, it accelerated. In the 70s, it accelerated, second wave feminism. In the 80s and 90s, it sort of didn't. And then suddenly, Me Too pushed it through to fourth wave feminism. So as an example, means that we have to alter our value equation in our needs and our value equations in our drivers. So really, we will have on our screens, like it's a list of falling and rising values in the same that the stock market will have its list of falling and rising prices. It's hugely important. As you know, when somebody asks a question, it's context that matters, content carefully, but also the consequence of how we say things inaccurately. So to refer to somebody as a lady, while it may have been acceptable even five years ago. Now, depending on the generational nuance, and this is why I think it, you know, it's important about the context, people will just pull a face. I mean, they won't be hugely offended as they should be, but actually increasingly it is an offense and it does offend people. So value and values, while they're generationally related, generations bring them in 
and they define and drive conversations. And they also determine whether people are listening or not to the conversation because an inappropriate value expressed brilliantly will still damage the message you are trying to transmit. So it's important to make sure that the message reflects the values of the listener, not just of the person who is delivering the message. Just for our listeners who may not have the, um, you know, the good fortune to work with um, a world leading forecaster such as yourself, um, how would you advise them in their sort of daily lives? Um, what sort of activities can they do in order for them to start really being able to have a better understanding of micro trends, macro trends, um, the implications for the future landscape, and you know how to sort of deepen their understanding of forecasting? Obviously, one is to get your book on, uh, you know, online, um, but just in the you know any sort of like little hacks day to day. Should they be reading certain newspapers or magazines, or or you know? How do they find the people who are articulating these different values and the margins of culture? Um, you know, what sort of advice would you give to our listeners? I, I think it's a really simple thing. I, I always draw up a line on a book and I, I put all of my prejudice and biases on one side and what things I believe in and, and care about on the other. And then I ignore the things I believe in and care about and I look at the prejudice and biases. That's where things are changing. And that's where I need to retest my principles and reevaluate my values. So people talk about, you know, woke in this terrible way as if, if it's, it's, it's doing some terrible damage to the planet. And I say, well, okay, do you remember manners? And people go, of course, we are, you know, particularly old people. Yes, we, we love manners. They well, right. So if I'd said to you, my name is Martin, would you insist on calling me George? Well, of course not. That's a stupid question. I said, well, well, so if somebody says my pronoun is she, or they, why do you argue with it? Because essentially, wokeism is nothing more than manners rebranded for the 21st century. So we need to understand, and therefore when I, I, I say to people about thinking about tomorrow, it's already happened. It's just not so well distributed that you potentially notice until it's too late. So what is wokeism to you is standard discourse to other people. So rather than spend your time arguing with them, the second thing I always recommend is be curious. Why are we thinking like this? Third bit is empathy, walking in the shoes of others. Think about their position, think about their life, their journey, and put yourself in their shoes because that's what the future is about. You are older, they are younger, or in my case, I'm older, but some people you know, say to me, okay, how do you think about that? I said, because I put my shoe, my, my feet in the shoes of the astronaut, in the shoes of somebody who's having to think about, you know, dealing with X or dealing with Y. And by doing that, we reach what I think is, is a position of being open minded. And I think there is a whole scientific community developed around the notion of, you know, open minded what they call um, transverse conversation, which is essentially where we also listen, assume a position that's the opposite of the one we feel, but then we go back into the one we feel and argue accordingly. And by doing that, you open up the ability to think and to flex and to re, I think, re-engineer your, you know, what I call neuroplasticity, make your brain less prejudiced, make your brain less susceptible to the belief that what you have experienced in life is naturally correct. And also I think the other bit is the, 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 what I call the Alice principle, the Alice in Wonderland, Red Queen, you know, to have each day wake up and think six impossible things. Because by doing that, you are absolutely challenging your brain to look at opposites, to look at disruptions, to look at newness. And all of these things are really the, the, you know, the, the, the seed or the lifeblood of a forecaster. But also, I would challenge people, they are probably the lifeblood of being a better human being. You know, to be optimistic, to be forever open, to be forever curious, to be forever um, empathic, and to be forever trying to understand how people not like you in the world walk forward. Because again, a lot of forecasting not to give the long answer, but a lot of forecasting is always about the dominant group telling others how tomorrow looks. 
Great. Um, thank you so much. I think, my God, we have covered so much ground um, and it's been absolutely fascinating. And I really do feel as if the forecasting um, discipline and the insight that you bring uh, is really an area for, for us as PRs to really contemplate and, and grow our sort of skill base. Uh, so a huge thank you, Martin, uh, for sharing your insight. Um, and, and, you know, for those who are listening who uh, want to know more about you, more about your work, um, to glean some more skills um you know could you please share with with our audience you know the books that you've you've written where they can get it from um your social media handles podcasts etc uh, so over to you martin thank you i mean look futurelaboratory.com their futurelaboratory.com the greatest place for 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 future forecasts um lsn global is has been described as the cnn of future news so it's our news um foresight channel uh my books the um trend forecasters handbook which has gone into seven different prints and i think about 25 different languages um probably more verbose than i am but certainly worth a read and Finally, I think the book I would recommend, it's a fiction book called The Ministry of the Future, which is a guy called Kim Stanley Robinson, which really gives you a fairly clear and proper framework from which to understand why today's decisions matter wholesale in the future. And it's really about how an industry or a ministry rather is set up to advocate for future generations and it gives you a sense of how potentially as businesses we can become advocates for future generations by asking the questions about tomorrow that require some answers and homework today martin as fatana said thank you so much for joining us here on fuse today and thank you for listening or watching this episode of fuse uh, please do subscribe share this with colleagues and friends rate and review where possible and of course you can always stay in touch with prca via all of the usual social media channels which you can find via their website <laughs>